Christy team. <laughs> you ready? You good? Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about the expectation of open source user experiences and how the competitive landscape has influenced teams to um, being more proactive as far as user experience design goes. Um, we're going to talk a bit about open source, open source UIs, as well as proactive and reactive um, design methodologies. And we're going to use Red Hat as a case to show examples of each and talk about how our UXD team has changed over the last five to six years. So my name is Serena Nichols. I'm the DevTools UX lead at Red Hat. I'm Colleen Hart. And I'm the OpenShift UX lead at Red Hat. So um, before we get into talking about the expectations of open source UX, um, let's try to understand you know why open source is getting so popular in general. I'm sure you know this is this is a crowd would kind of agree, but um, technology thrives in the open, and it's it's a proven way to collaborate with in the software space because people are, are sharing and being collaborative and kind of just building on top of others' work. So in a, in a panel earlier this morning, I think Sarah did a great job of kind of summarizing this where you know, you're building something, but you can only reach some certain limit without help help from others. So you're, you're just kind of continuing to build on others' work by providing feedback or accepting feedback um, in some cases. So it's kind of this continual cycle where it's everyone's being more transparent, but the end product is is um, benefits from that. So with people wanting more more awareness, everyone's uh, kind of pushed into this open source atmosphere, and uh, everything's everything's in the open. So with design in the open, um, how can we think about the user experience design process in open source? And it's the same principles. So it's it's about being transparent with your designs and your processes. So it's allowing others to, to contribute or uh, contribute new designs maybe or provide feedback on, on existing designs or ways to actually um, improve. So maybe it's giving an uh, avenue for others in, in a community to provide comments um, or propose changes and kind of lead that discussion in an open platform. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, open source UIs. In the past, providing reactive design was kind of perceived as just doing enough to make products more usable. Um, and like, if you look back to like 2000, 2013 and before, enterprise software was really considered hard to use and cumbersome. Um, and in then 2014 and 15, what we saw, see, what you saw happening was companies like Salesforce and Google started investing a lot of money into user experience, and they were really started to be referred to as um, the pioneers of enterprise UX and kind of pushed the UX movement um, across enterprise UIs where there was a lot more focus on usability. So today, companies are heavily investing in UX, and they're really utilizing more proactive design methodologies. They have a lot more investment in UX, meaning they have a, a larger UX department. They have more resources, um, and they're really able to kind of go through that process of, um, of research and design and collaboration before development and throughout development. So now we're going to examine the progression of UX in uh, of UX in Red Hat itself. Um, so if we look back at Red Hat in 2013, our UX team was centralized, and we had about 10 people by the end of the year. Um, here's an example of I think six of our interfaces, where you, as you can see, they're very disparate user interfaces that felt super disconnected as a whole. Um, they were they varied in behaviors and each dev team was spent time and energy to develop all of you know all the user interfaces separately there was nothing in common between the two 
So if you kind of fast forward about three years, our UXD team had then grown to about 50 people. Um, not only did were we comprised of interaction designers and visual designers, but we also expanded to include both uh, researchers as well as front-end development, and our team really started to take off. We had a, defined a set of common user experience standards, which we called Patternfly at that point, which had implementation in both Angular and um, React. And our product designers and our developers were really able to utilize Patternfly to make those products look like a single product portfolio. Um, and as well as, since they use common components, they had some level of consistency between them. So as you can see, like this set of six products looks way more um, consistent and really feels like a single portfolio versus you know three or four years before. So now in 2019, clearly Red Hat is really uh, invested into the user experience uh, in usability. Um, our UXD team now has 106 people, and uh, Patternfly has now evolved to be our open source design system. It's called now Patternfly 4. It's been revamped to provide modular, accessible, and responsive components, and it's really driving our new UIs. Um, here you see a, a few screens of our newer products that are uh, really using Patternfly 4. And the expectations of open source software really continues to increase. So Red Hat's clearly, like I mentioned, um, continuing to invest in UX and designers and bring a more proactive user experience design into our projects. Yeah, so thinking about um, you know proactive design, this, this gets us into this topic of what is proactive design versus reactive design. Uh, so proactive design is is really when you're you get a lot of information up front because um, you're you're going through an entire UX process of gathering information, research, observing users um, to to get that information. And because you're you're driving that process, you have more influence. So you're you're working to funnel down to to a design um, to f affect the whole user experience and the whole the whole flow of a user versus on the reactive side you're you have less influence because it's really driven by by the product so what exists in the product you're making some minor tweaks um, but you're not driving based on you know this information gathering it's kind of here's the problem let's let's react so there's more a little more concern and a scramble to make some minor improvements along the way. Um, so taking a deep dive into proactive to start. So proactive is is a holistic approach. Uh, like I was saying, you, you'd have, in this case, you have, as a designer, more influence. So over that entire, thinking about that entire flow, you're solving a, a greater challenge, um, a user challenge, something that, that users are stumbling across. So thinking about um, exploring with usability testing or even just observing users. Sarah, one of our researchers, was talking um, today about just observing and, and understanding what problems users are going through by just asking them questions or even just watching how they use a product um, can be really helpful. So suggesting um, alternatives based on these these observations takes time and that's kind of the, the downside of this proactive design you have to invest in it up front so Serena talked about the trends is moving that in that direction um, but you know it's it's definitely not easy it takes it takes time and, and planning uh, but results results are worth it so um, Looking at some of the quotes we found that, that resonated with us on the proactive design side are where proactive designs are informed by actual user needs, not by guesses about how people might use a product. And designs are designers are empowered to promote what an ideal experience could be. So it's really in a proactive design case, you're providing even more guidance because of that research you've done up front. So without it, you're you're only fixing you know part of the problem because you're fixing a problem based on um, something that already exists in a, in a product. So maybe it's caused by decisions that were made ahead of time into the into the product versus understanding users' needs and solving the problem up front. 
So looking at an ideal flow, creating journey maps for, for user flows up front, you're, you're dictating kind of what that flow should be rather than backtracking in a proactive design case. So the ideal process is probably something, some version of this, um, we've probably all seen, it's, it's really the design thinking process or, you know, I'm sure there's various buzzwords for it, but it's really taking into account some process where on the UX side you're thinking about the discovery phase, which is really important in the proactive side, so running usability tests, competitive analysis, interviews, really digging into the personas to understand who you're designing for up front before you're jumping into actually creating journey maps and kind of conceptual designs, then getting into wireframing, prototyping, and kind of that, some, some iteration there before actually some impl implementation. And even after implementation, we'd like to be able to test and retest and kind of iterate a bit there on, on some of the designs. So the proactive design process is really kind of what we'd, we'd think about as our I ideal approach if we have the time and, and the resources. Okay, so now we're going to take um, a case study for, a, for proactive design, which is OpenShift topology. Um, so the topology view is something that we wanted to be able to visualize application topology of an OpenShift project. Um, and so we started this effort in late 2017. And as part of our discovery phase at one of our customer conferences, um, one of our designers um, held a, a, an activity where they asked all participants to kind of roughly draw out a diagram of their architecture on pieces of paper and explain and discuss how those parts interacted between each other. Um, and these are a few examples of those. So these were, you know, trying to really understand how people's products, how, how people were working with OpenShift and um, what their architecture was like so that we could help figure out how to visualize these um, in our product. So as part of the create phase, mockups mock are created and, you know, we did the typical sharing with internal and external stakeholders for feedback, and this was a super iterative process. We had, we were lucky enough to have um, time on our side, so we we had quite a lot of time to do different iterations and get feedback from customers. So based on some of the feedback that we did get from customers, you see a, a new set of designs were created, relationships are different, what you're seeing visually is different, the information that you're seeing is different, and this came to be like, from a product perspective, what we really wanted to try to achieve. So based on mockups, what we decided to do was POC it. So based on the API support that was currently existing in the product, we tried to have somebody develop a POC and see how much we could achieve. Um, some of the data wasn't available, so we had to cut some functionality out. And the other thing that we figured out was like some of the interactions that we wanted to achieve really weren't as possible as we thought they were. So again, we went back through and did another iteration on the design. And then we had uh, our team started to implement that early this year. Um, and this is kind of going through a usability test that we held at Red Hat Summit, which is our con customer conference um, in May this year, and got additional feedback. And so since then, we've tweaked it a little bit. And what you're going to see here is kind of a preview of our final product. And Half of you are from the UX team team, so you know that, but we're also running a usability test on the topology view um, in the cafeteria area if anybody's interested in doing it tomorrow or Saturday. Um, but this is going to be part of OpenShift 4.2. But this is a really good example of being able to um, go from... You know, to having a long, a long time period, all, just about two years from start to finish, where we were able to do user research, competitive analysis, multiple iterations of design, collaborating with de development as well, and, and being able to produce something in time for a release. 
Uh, yeah, and just looking at uh, another use case, not quite the, the two-year lead time, but similarly still a, a proactive design use case for sure. We had um, maybe just under six months, at least three to six months for, for this uh, feature we were working, working on. Same product, we were looking to um, create a service catalog. And it started with um, a bunch of research up front. So we did a, a number, of, we, we went through a number of um, interviews and conversations with stakeholders and looked a, at four or five competitors and did some expert reviews of strengths, weaknesses, kind of what these products um, that were already out there were, were doing and what we could kind of learn from the existing competition. So that first phase was super important for the service catalog design as well. And then we jumped into kind of following that at least month or so in the research phase. We, we jumped into the, the concepts and started thinking about how we wanted to structure this thing and how a user might flow through uh, the various pages or areas of this catalog. So we kind of had a team, a, a couple of us were working on the early concepts and then came together and picked what we liked and, and didn't like of, of the various concepts to pick, basically to create our, our, our ideal uh, scenario and, and move forward from there. So still on the, on the creation side, but moving, you're, you'll notice it's, it started to move more towards a higher fidelity um, mock-up. So we, we, on the far left, still we're in balsamic, lower fidelity, but as you get to, towards the bottom, we start working with the visual design team within our group to get that high, high resolution um, to be ready for development. So as we passed it on and started working with the development team, we um, got some prototypes implemented that we could tweak a bit and, and test a bit at, at Red Hat Summit, um, get some user initial user feedback based on those, those prototypes, and kind of go back, like we said in that process, go back and iterate on some of these designs to, to tweak them a bit, make some improvements where we could, kind of based on a couple of the things that we noticed. So uh, one key being, you know, not everyone, depending on their environment, not everyone would see those um, highlighted items at the top. So that whole blue area might go away. You know, what can we do to make this catalog a little bit more interesting, maybe pop a bit more? And what can we do to make the categories stand out a bit more? So, you know, once we saw it and watched users interact with it, we kind of realized, okay, we need to make some adjustments. Let's add some search capabilities in here. Let's add um, a, a tour so users know how to use this new product. So kind of that revamp and then it went through another round of, of implementation with those updated designs. So definitely another example where we followed that longer lead time proactive design cycle. Okay, so now we're going to dive into a reactive design. Um, so by a show of hands, how many of you guys think that reactive design is a bad thing? Um, so reactive design is not design driven, right? It emphasizes that UX is an afterthought, which for sometimes for a designer, it's not like what we like to hear, right? Because we want, a lot of times we want to hear that, that the development's going to listen to us. Um, so here's a quote about reactive design. It's just what it sounds like, reacting to a problem in the moment. So oftentimes we're asked how we can fix something. Help users are complaining and these things are too hard, so what can we do? So reactive design really results in fix, fixing problems um, on this, based on decisions that have already been made or implemented. So uh, is it a good thing to do reactive design? It definitely is, right? I mean, sometimes people think about applying a Band-Aid or putting lipstick on a pig. Adding, you know, adding visual improvements, syntax changes, um, UX is being an afterthought. But really, it, it's not impacting the end-to-end -end user experience, but it's still improving usability as a whole, um, and it's better than nothing. So. Um, you know, I, I think one of the questions we have here is like, how many companies have enough designers that are able to provide thoughtful designs for every feature that we create? That doesn't happen. So in, in actuality, developers are going to have to develop things when, when they don't necessarily have a design and then use reactive design as a tool to make things better. Um, 
So yeah, I think a positive uh, use case for a reactive design, pre, uh, well, this will be very familiar to, to you, but basically the um, we had a case where a feature was upcoming in, in our product um, pretty, pretty recently, and development, you know, the development team had a, a cool idea to expose this API Explorer into um, our product, and it's, it's an interesting concept that we hadn't chatted about on the design side at all, and we kind of got brought in after this initial POC was created. So on, on the UX side, we're thinking, okay, we're in the reactive state. We want to get this into an upcoming release. You know, how can we make some improvements to start, um, but it's already, it's already created and seemingly going in the product as is. So one thing we did was just take a step back a bit and try to think about, you know, can we validate some of the assumptions and use cases that this is solving? What are the, what's driving this um, requirement and, and need in the product to help us understand how we can then improve it in the product? Um, like Serena said, of course, there's, you know, there's minor tweaks we can make, but we really wanted to make it a, a usable feature that will succeed in the product. So. When development is asking us for for help on something already implemented, we can still do some of that like gut check of what what is this uh, requirement, what is it fulfilling this feature. So, looking at our reactive designs, we have a couple couple of examples, but a few of the things we looked at were can we just make it a bit more usable by adding some filter capabilities, some search capabilities, sorting, um, some basic things. You know, we kept the, you'll notice we kept the basic structure of there's a page somewhere in the navigation that has this list view of things and when you actually dive into one of the objects, you're getting more information about what metadata is available for that resource. Um, so it was still a list view and a detail page, but just adjusting kind of how some of that information might show up and how users might flow through the pages, I think we got some, some improvement from these designs. So just simple things like adding, adding tabs or adding some hierarchy to the page. Um, we got some, some improvements there. And just a, a couple other screens from the design side. We were thinking about this. Maybe it's not uh, the V1 um, version of this feature, but maybe it's something we can implement moving forward and make it even better by adding this throughout the product. So this feature in particular is allowing you to explore various resource types in one exploration area, but you know, what if we provided that help in context? So when you're looking at a specific resource, like a pod, you could see, you could access this exploration help in that context. Maybe using using a side panel was, was the recommendation in that screenshot on the left. And part of the reason for that is that was an existing design convention or, or pattern that we're already using in other places in the product. So it's kind of one of those, in a reactive design state, you're trying to make use of things that already exist. You know, do you have enough lead time to introduce completely new patterns? Probably not, but maybe you could think about that for a forward-looking feature and in the meantime make use of some existing patterns that you have to improve the, the feature. So that's kind of what, what we look to do and um, creating even just like some, some of the tabs, some of the side panel designs that you see on, on these pages. And then when we got back to the updated implementation, just searching through for some of these screenshots on GitHub, there were 17 or 18 pull requests related to, to this feature. So the, the key was definitely collaboration. So we had a lot of collaboration across, back and forth between design and development. And there were a lot of these minor changes, you know, let's implement sort. Another PR, let's let's look at filtering. So it was definitely a success in my mind because of that collaboration. So a couple things. It built it built trust for sure, going back and forth with design and development working hand in hand. But it also we we definitely both learned something from each other. So I think on our side, on the on the design side, we learned by seeing their initial POC, like what was possible and what what this feature could do for the product, what was kind of um, available via the APIs, and maybe what limitations we had today. It was a little bit more clear to see versus 
if you don't have any anything up front to, to work from, it can take a long time to gain that product knowledge and, and do that upfront research work. Sometimes two years, hopefully, not always, but that's kind of why, you know, in some cases this can speed up the design process, and I think it, it did for us creating this feature. So, you know, building trust, collaborating, it, it was it was a positive result. Um, so I would consider reactive design as being something that can work if both groups are, are kind of on board. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about a couple more examples of reactive design. Um, not specific examples, but just general. But I, I do want to kind of reiterate what Colleen said and, and what I said previously as well is in open source companies, collaboration is key, right? It's one of the biggest premises that we have. Um, and I think that is what really makes reactive design work better. Uh, being previous to Red Hat, I worked in a company that was not open source and the collaboration was not the same. So I think I think, at least here at Red Hat, reactive design to me is much more um, successful. So another example where reactive design can be useful is, like if you you know you discover usability issue during beta testing, right? Um, and it needs to be addressed before GA. So in this case, you're up against a time crunch. Uh, you need to kind of research what the problem is and determine how to best solve it. And you probably have to collaborate with your stakeholders, product management, as well as developers to identify what you know. How much can you fix? How much? How much based on the time that you have? Um, this could include addressing the problem completely, um, or if you can't, like maybe you can still improve it by providing contextual help or adding some documentation to explain the problem or how to fix it. Um, and then you can also be sure to plan for a better solution that can be implemented, you know, in the in the next release. And another example where reactive design is productive is if a designer tags the developer, um, you know, in a work in progress PR, for example, and they're looking for somebody to collaborate with. Um, in this case, you probably have more time since the developer has asked for your help, and you're, you know, you want to work with them to understand what the issue is, and take advantage of your design system. So, like Colleen said, um, look and see if there's any patterns or design conventions that you can apply to, to the problem to help fix it, or at least provide some consistency. Um, and again, if it, there's not enough time to fix it the right way, just suggest a stopgap and see if you can implement that and follow up with a plan for a better solution that can be um, implemented in the next release. So now we're just going to go over a few of uh, best practices or lessons learned. Um, so when proactive design works well, um, it's a great tool to take advantage of when you have the resources. So if it's a new product, if it's a new feature of a product, and you have a considerable amount of time available um, to work on the design. Um, when can it go wrong? When you don't have very much time to market, right? So there's a couple of ex examples. One, if you just need to get something out in a release very quickly. Um, another example where proactive design doesn't work well is in open source when we're using new technologies and we might be designing with an alpha version of something and APIs are going to change really quickly. Sometimes you just have to, you know, in that case, you're going to have to use reactive because you're probably whatever design you produce is probably going to get changed when alpha, when the software goes from alpha to beta and the APIs change. Um, so, the, you know, there's definitely situations when proactive does not work well um, as well when the when the time to market is limited. Yeah, I think some of the lessons learned. So, when when can reactive work well? It's a couple of things we just discussed in the last use case, but really, for one, in the open source, like Serena said, in collaborative environments, that definitely helps. So you can have that, like the, that Explorer feature I was talking about, you can have that back and forth um, conversation. You definitely, I think, need that in the reactive uh, state. And then when, when teams are agile and ready for 
features or pages to change quickly. So you're making incremental changes. You can make some uh, iteration, some changes, you know, in version one, and then iterate on them in the next release or in the next cycle. And as long as everyone's kind of on board, yeah, we're going to revisit this page maybe again and again. Um, that's okay. You know, that's kind of part of this reactive side when you're making these small improvements to get something out the door that's usable enough um, at times. So if everyone's kind of on, on board on the same page, then reactive can work. Um, also to improve product cohesiveness. So, you know, we kind of joked about it, just sticking a Band-Aid on it, but it's, it's actually, you know, it's important. So look and feel does matter, and... We, we try to be just looking at some of those screenshots from the beginning of our products way back when in 2013 I think they were from the, the portfolio didn't look cohesive and that's that's something that at Red Hat we've been trying to focus on to make it look like one one cohesive unit so yeah some some minor tweaks you can make on being reactive could be some visual changes look and feel things um, they're important and they do make a difference at the end for for the full user experience and, and user flows and then similarly the the syntax so keeping it consistent whether it's conceptual help um, contextual help excuse me or it's um, field labels or Tool tips, you know, simple things that can be reactive, like oh, let's try and make the, make these changes uh, before a release goes out the door. Those are things to to look for where reactive can can be okay. Uh, do we want to only think about the content strategy a, from a reactive standpoint? Definitely not, but um, it's ways to sneak in some of that some of that work as a quote-unquote afterthought um, to sneak some of it in. But yeah, you should. we should do all of this on a proactive base as well. Um, so I guess, yeah. I was going to say, I think there's one other thing that like we're, we're coming at it from, because we're working on web applications right. too, right? So if you want to think about things like if you have a SaaS offering or websites, I think reactive comes more into play as well because you have a shorter development cycle. Um, but we're yeah. definitely looking at it from the point of view where we have at least a three or six month release cycle. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you can make more immediate changes, it's definitely easier. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So yeah, in, in summary, you know, we mentioned this a number of times, the collaboration, but the key to success with design is to be collaborative and iterative at every stage. So there's, there's really a place for both proactive and reactive design for, you know, in every case, I, I think. So you can use both depending on um, your lead time and, and what scenario you have. Um, but yeah, in today's landscape, you need both. So curious if anyone should. That's all we got. I understand what you're saying about the strength of the proactive approach. Um, and from what I'm seeing, it looks like it's always attached to a, a product, right? That's kicking off the cycle. Um, is there any room for like doing that on its own as kind of like just pushing the, the boundaries of UX and then applying those uh, lessons learned when a product comes up? Or do you always attach it to a product? I think I understand. So you're saying, is there room to, like, before there is a product, to do some proactive research to understand, like, what even? Yeah, yeah. It's like, um, you know, where I come from, like, everything's product driven. We're doing all of our UX work to service a product, and it's never really any time to just kind of do research on our own and then apply it to a future product. So I'm wondering if you get a chance to do that. I didn't hear the total end there, but you're, I think, I guess from my perspective, yeah, we, we are thinking about it in terms of, you know, adding specific features to the product, but I'm trying to think. I could see from a research perspective, I mean, I think there's always room for proactive design. Like, if there's researchers in the room, they'd probably agree that talking to users, you know, anytime you have a large amount of lead time talking to users, you, you kind of can't go wrong. Like, it's hard to argue with data. So whenever we're struggling with some of our 
design decisions, we often turn to the research team and ask to run usability tests, even if it's thing, you know, we've gotten anecdotal feedback here or there on, on random features, like, we often will turn to the research team and ask to say, take a step back and just ask them to just go talk to users, whether it's they give a certain direction or in some cases they don't, like, they, they'll run a really open ended research activity to try to get feedback from users that like those users are actually thinking about rather than us dictating like tell me about this specific product or feature or page kind of like what do you do today to use you know what do you use today how do you go about your everyday what can we learn from them to bring that data back but I don't know if that like an answers your question I think the other thing too is like at Red Hat we have product managers that set the direction of the product right so they're out there talking to customers every day, so they kind of have like that future vision, version, vision of where we want to go. So oftentimes, by the time we start working on something, like there's already there's already an epic that says, okay, this is what we want to do in the next set of re in the next release. Here's what we want to focus on because they've already done their research based on competitive analysis as well as talking to customers and how they're using the products today. So our level of research is, and interaction with customers is different. It's like, it's more usability than it is uh, understanding the products at a higher level. So, I don't know if that helps. Thank you. So user, user experience is far more than user interface. Um, and uh, I know <clears throat> Red Hat as a you know uh, old school geek company, belt and suspenders, Linux world, a lot of old deckies came from a very command line, even pre web uh, focus, and that you see that in a lot of the products. I think that's what you were dealing with with a lot of those early interfaces, um, but. The uh, the risk on going the whole UI way is to end up with where Microsoft was in, which is that you can only do certain use cases through the UI. And I was wondering if in your team you're getting a um, an emphasis on being able to span the whole realm of user experience, not just um, web UI, but from new user being exposed to a system at both the, ideally web UI is, is, is a wonderful way to bring them in there, but to be able to think in the terms of bringing them from new user through to power user, or to be able to say, okay, eventually they need to be able to take the workflows that they're doing here as a, a one-off on the web into our automation tool chain and getting it into Ansible or something like that. And so there is a whole workflow there. Is that part of the language that we use when we talk about the round trip of, of user experience design? I think we're getting there. I can give the example. So for OpenShift in 4.2, we're going to have a developer perspective or developer console, right? And they have an associated CLI called Odeo. And so what we're talking about is making sure any improvements that we're doing in the user experience, we also kind of match in the CLI to provide consistency between the two. Is, is the developer going to be able to do that? Like, I just did this in the UI. I want to see the ODL command to do the same thing from the command line? Is the developer, I'm, so, I'm sorry, are they going to be able to? So not just us be able to, you know, us as Red Hat and, the, you know, the, the, the wizard in the world. To, to, to be able to put that power in the hands of the developer to say, okay, I just clicked through. How, how would I do that from the command line? To be able to teach them that? So, oddly enough, there has been some discussion about that in the last couple of weeks, whether or not it will happen in the next six months. I don't but know. The, but that, that is how you talk about but things. But there that has is, been okay. some increased discussion around that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll give you the examples with Knative and serverless and yep. how that's going to, you know, how those all come together in the developer console and... Uh, there was a face-to-face -face a couple weeks ago, and some of that stuff started. Wonderful. We Thanks. started talking about those, but in my experience, that's brand new, hearing those conversations. I have not heard them very frequently before. 
So hopefully that's where we're going. <laughs> and I don't know, like I don't know if you guys on the OpenShift side with OC, do you have any interaction with? No, we don't. But we've started to hear a lot more from, like when we've talked to users, we're hearing a lot that they're using the UI or coming to the UI to learn. You know, new users often are trying to learn. You know, what's how do I kind of get started? What's what? What are these different resources? What are these different workloads? And they're kind of there to learn. And once, like you said, they're they progress. Some sometimes they they're progressing into maybe a more power user. Maybe they're only using the command line at some point. But we ended up talking to a lot of users that because they're using it to learn, a lot of these features are coming up where we want to help teach them through the UI, whether it's contextual help or kind of pointing to different sections. But one of the things we've talked about is adding some you know, he, some hints of, okay, you can take, you can only take this flow so far in the UI, and here's a hint of how you go run this in the command line. So providing some hints or tips of either how you do the equivalent task in the, through the command line or how you can expand on a flow to do more complex or more advanced tasks through the command line, like providing that in, in the UI in context so that people can learn and eventually get to a place where they are doing those advanced things, maybe without the UI. We've started to talk about that for sure. This is a lag. Uh, so the other question is, uh, I know how the Red Hat product cycle works, and it's built on the idea of taking a successful open source product and locking it at a certain uh, compatibility level and backporting fixes and changes to that. So RHEL 7, there's a certain expectation that if something works on RHEL 7, it will work through the entire RHEL 7 life cycle, and that when we go from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8, we can make big changes and break things. And we have the same thing with OpenShift going from three to four, and I think we've seen that OpenShift 4 is going to break a few workflows because there are some really, really different assumptions in there, and so when, when a customer, and my customers are, are banks, so they're fairly risk adverse, when they're going to make a change like that, you know, it's, it's a huge impact, and they'll probably put that off for a long time. Um, what... Uh, on putting on your, your red hats, um, what requirements are put on you for user experience and user ID, uh, UI changes within a single product line versus, so kind of reactive versus proactive, like what can you do between OpenShift 4.2 and 4.3 um, and what would you have to wait for OpenShift 5 to be able to do for changes? What are the guidelines that you're given that way? I don't know. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, so we started work, Colleen and I started working on OpenShift at the same time, and that was at three on 3.7, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to think of what was the big change between 3.7 and 4.0 really is the UI is that 4.0 is tectonic. It's based off of the Tectonic Core OS acquisition, right? Um, that's the only major release we've been brought to. So I don't really know the difference between a major release. The difference between minor dot releases is more time-based, as far as I've, as, as I've seen. So it's not like you, you can only do a certain thing. It's really just how much can you get in in, in a three-month or six-month cycle. I'll give you an example that might frame what I'm trying to ask. Okay. Um, so in IPA, in, in, in IDM, we have a tab on the top, and I know this intimately because I, I worked on it, and this, is, this was a sticking point, where it's called network services. And underneath there, there's DNS and there's auto mount. And if you take it from a UX perspective, DNS is a dominant use case. I might deploy IPA solely to get DNS there. The number of people who know how to do auto mount that would do it through the UI is probably zero. So we've taken a really important UI element and hit it behind this idea of network network services. And this is something that should be, and I filed the bug and the bug was overturned because the UI developer didn't talk to customers and didn't see it the same way. It was like functional fitness in this. And I, but I could see his point, which is changing something like this breaks things because there's an expectation that it's gonna be there. And so he actually had a really good point, which is you shouldn't break that expectation. Except, and I'm trying to figure out where is is there other so guidelines kind of, so like that? So it's like a regression, then. Essentially, if you you if you did that, you would no longer be able to satisfy that use case in the UI if you removed it. Kind of. 
it might be tagged as a regression. I mean, the UI is not automated, so it's going to be a human looking at that, so they could still yeah. do it, right? If there was a DNS tab now at the top, they wouldn't, they, it wouldn't break them that perspective. And this is a human judgment, obviously. Right. Whereas if you thought, oh, for your DNS, I need to go into network services and then see DNS there, um, and it's not there, um, then that would break them. And thinking, okay, we have to do something with auto mount. If we buried auto mount, that would, that would break it. But to just change this here would not be a, it, from an automation perspective, it wouldn't be a, a non-backwards compatible change. So do we think in these terms? Do we have restrictions or requirements along these terms? When we talk about dealing with UI changes from minor version or major version? I know it's a hard question. I don't know that I'm framing it that well. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it's more because we just don't have as much experience going through the major versions. I don't okay. within the same product. Um, yes. So, for example, going from 3X to 4, right? So not only did we do the, we do went anything. to Tectonic, but in addition to that, a lot of the developer workflows are no longer available in 4.0 right. or 4.1. So perfect reason to have it a major, a, a major bump. Um, and then in 4.2, that's why we're starting to introduce the developer console. Um, I don't particularly know if there's anything like written about that, though. Interesting question. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everybody.